Thank you. Thank you very much. For me, um, America means, um, means the world. I, um, I'm so honored to be here. I'm so honored to speak on behalf of brave men and women who have fought for their country, my country. And um, there's a big fight ahead of us. And so I'm glad that some of these men and women are stepping to the plate to run for office because the country needs them in more ways than on the battlefield. There's, there's actually a bigger battlefield. It's been a long evening. I don't want to give a long speech. Um, I guess I'll try to adopt the motto that King Henry VIII used with one of his wives. He said, I won't keep you too long. <laughs> but, but, but we are in a big, we are in a big fight. And what I'd like to do briefly this evening is to try to give you a perhaps fresh picture of what this political battlefield really looks like. We see the battlefield and we're fighting, but we're actually only fighting in one corner of the battlefield. And so the other side, it's taking territory, because we're not even aware that the battlefield is much larger than we think. And our strategy for fighting this battle is really bad. And that's why, even though truth is on our side, and our ideas work, and theirs don't, you still have to explain why they're winning politically. That's because we obviously are not fighting in the correct way. Now, what is this fight really all about? We have been living in the past 60 years in what can be called the American era. The American era. It's been a very special time to be an American. In fact, the founders dream around the table in Philadelphia. The founders believe they had a special new formula and that if this formula were to be adopted, this new country, America, would over time become the strongest, the most prosperous, the most admirable, the most successful, the most magnetically attractive society in the world. And that dream, the founders' dream, has been realized really only in the 20th century. America's been a superpower, by the way, since World War II. America's only been the sole superpower since the Soviet Union collapsed in 1992. So for really only two decades. And yet, here we are, America, we're, we're on top of the world, and yet we feel a powerful drag pulling us down. And so we look abroad. We don't see any Nazis on the horizon. The Soviet Union is dissolved. Now, you do have the radical Muslims, and they are a powerful threat. And yet, a unified America could crush them at a blow. The real reason that America is facing so much difficulty, economic difficulty, political difficulties, difficulties on the foreign policy front, and also challenges in our culture, in our moral values. The reason for that is that the really powerful drag on America, I believe, is not coming from outside of America, it's coming from within. We're facing something within America that's pulling us down. Now, in my first film, uh, 2016, which I, in retrospect, realized was kind of a horror film, um, I focused on, on one man, uh, Obama. But in the new film, America, I realize that Obama can't, Obama talked about remaking America. But one man can't remake a country. You need a powerful movement to do that. And Obama has one. It's this progressive movement 
that has been building and growing and gathering force since the 1960s. Obama did not create that movement. The movement created him. And while Republicans and conservatives are in a kind of huddle trying to figure out how to take back the Senate, who do we field in 2016, where's the next Reagan, this progressive team has been burrowing its way through academia, the elementary and secondary schools, the media, national public radio, the entertainment industry, including Broadway and Hollywood, the mainline churches. So while the conservatives are doing the little political thing, in other words, fighting in one corner of the battlefield, the left has made the long march through the institutions of education, media, and culture. And thus they have built and now control huge megaphones to get their message out to hundreds of millions of people. Now, as a result, when you shift the culture, you're able to move the goalposts of politics. Look at an issue like gay marriage. In some ways, when you shift people's assumptions on that topic, one, by the time it comes around to a political vote, you don't even have to vote. You've already lost because the assumptions of the culture have already moved. Now, I want to say I agree with some earlier speakers who have emphasized that America's power in the world and America's strength as a society is not purely military. I don't agree that the debt is our overwhelming problem. It is a serious problem. But I do agree that America's strength as a country depends on our economy. The reason we're a military superpower is because we're an economic superpower. When we cease to be an economic superpower, we will also cease to be a military superpower. And America's strength is also in our culture, in our values, our sense of national unity and patriotism. If we don't care about our country, we're not going to have men and women who are willing to die for it. Now, when we listen to guys um, like Obama, we hear something that is, to patriotic minds and ears, very disconcerting. Because intuitively, we realize that they hear a very different music when they hear the name America. By the way, this has nothing to do with being a Republican or being a Democrat. If you went to Bill Clinton and said, Mr. Clinton, do you want the United States to be the greatest power in the world, to remain the world's number one for as long as possible, yes or no? I am absolutely convinced that he would answer yes. But when you go to Obama, you get a different answer. Oh, write it out of Obama's own words. Whether we like it or not, I quote him, America is the sole superpower. Whether we like it or not. You almost get the idea that he would rather we weren't. But since we are, it's something he's going to have to deal with. Now, what does dealing with it mean? Now, I've heard it tonight, and I hear it all the time, that Obama doesn't understand what's at stake. He doesn't understand what's going on in the world. And presumably, it is our job to educate him. And so I hear on talk radio, I hear on Fox News, I hear in the op-eds, incredible conservative and Republican punditry all aimed at educating Obama on what the world is really like. Mr. Obama, we want to remind you that Vladimir Putin is not our friend. We want to remind you that he used to be a KGB officer. Let us helpfully supply you with maps of the Crimea. Let us tell you that the Muslim Brotherhood is the oldest organization of radical Islam in the world, founded in 1928. Khomeini actually uh, has descendants who want to get an atomic bomb. The mullahs are trying to build one, and so on, and so on, and so on. And Obama seems serenely, blissfully uninterested in all this. And let me suggest it is not because he doesn't know. It's actually because he doesn't 
care. And the reason that he doesn't care is that he has a very different compass of seeing the world. He has, if you will, a lens, an ideology, from which he interprets the world. This ideology is one, again, that's not unique to him. It developed in America in the 1960s. A few months ago, I marched into the Fox News Channel um, carrying on a platter, I might say so, Bill Ayers, uh, the former domestic terrorist. I was taking him to the Megyn Kelly show for Megyn Kelly to do her usual Megyn Kelly grilling. Um, now, this week, this week uh, I was in the Fox Channel again doing the same thing with another guy, Ward Churchill, a guy who actually said that um, we deserved it at 9-11. That was the case of the, the chickens coming home to roost. Now, here's the interesting fact. It's not that you got this crazy, you know, domestic bin Laden Bill Ayers. You got this radical extremist Ward Churchill. The interesting point is that these guys have been in the respectable progressive and liberal camp for 30 years teaching at major universities. Bill Ayers had the introductory cocktail party in his apartment that launched the career of Barack Obama. They were socially friends. They served on boards together. Bill Ayers' wife is a professor of law at Northwestern University. Now, how is this actually possible? On the conservative side, it's completely impossible. I mean, you can't have somebody who's like a skinhead or a member of the Ku Klux Klan who is an influential figure in the Republican Party. That never happens. But in the Democratic, in the liberal camp, it is quite possible for a Bill Ayers to flourish, to be welcomed. Why? Because the underlying assumptions of what these guys are saying are actually shared. In fact, are the mainstream way of thinking on the political left. Now, the ordinary guy on the left doesn't want to blow up the Pentagon, as Ayers tried to, doesn't think we deserved it on 9-11, but does agree, does agree, that the United States, on balance, has been a force for oppression, domination, looting, plunder, and murder around the world. Now, you have to pause for a moment to realize how new this is in American politics. In other words, if we go back a generation, there was an agreement in American politics between both sides that America was a good country, that the free market system was the, the goose that laid the golden eggs. You might disagree about how to distribute the eggs, but the idea that you wanted to keep the goose alive, everybody agreed with that. The notion that America was a force for good in the world, you didn't have to convince Franklin Roosevelt or Truman or John F. Kennedy that that was the case. So this was the, America was a country where people agreed on goals but disagreed about the means to get there. That consensus is no longer in America now. And that's why when the ordinary American uninvolved in politics says, oh gee, I just wish you guys would sit down and get along and work it out, we can't work it out. And the reason we can't work it out, we don't agree on goals anymore. Now, the underlying assumption of modern progressivism fully shared by Obama is that if America, if America is a force for bullying, arrogance, hegemony, and domination in the world, then we are the bad guys. If we are the bad guys, the guys who are fighting against us are the good guys because they are trying to liberate their countries from us. If we are the illegitimate invaders of Iraq and Afghanistan, the Iraqis and, Afghanistan and Afghans who are shooting at us, are the equivalent of Nelson Mandela and Gandhi and all the freedom fighters of the 50s and 60s who fought to free their countries from foreign domination. The foreign dominators are us. In other words, 
For the past 40 years in the Cold War, we tried to contain the Soviet Union because Reagan said the Soviet Union was an evil empire. If you believe that the United States is an evil empire, you're going to focus your attention on containing us. Now, let me be clear about what I'm saying. What I'm actually saying is not that we have a president or a ruling party that hates America, but that sees America as having done a lot of bad things and sees it as a moral thing, a good thing, to restrict, shrink, and narrow America's influence in the world. If you want to know why our allies have been falling one by one, in Egypt, the United States was allied with Mubarak. Down goes Mubarak. Gaddafi was not exactly an ally. He was a thug. But since 2002, he'd been doing business with us. He's gone. Who remains in power? Assad in Syria, the mullahs in Iran. Somehow our friends are gone or weaker, and our enemies are manifestly stronger. That's a fact. Now, again, this is not due to incompetence. The record for American presidential incompetence remains firmly and securely in the control of Jimmy Carter. He is the reigning holder of the title. He's not giving it up. Think back for a moment. We heard a, a kind of chilling account a moment ago about the Middle East. Jimmy Carter faced a crisis in the Middle East, and he responded with appropriate presidential nincompoopery. He, he pulled the Persian rug out from under the Shah, and whoops, he got Khomeini. But nobody for five minutes thought that Jimmy Carter wanted Khomeini. He simply ignored the core principle of American foreign policy. What is the core principle of American foreign policy? The principle of the lesser evil. In trying to get rid of the bad guy, try to make sure you don't get the worst guy. That's nincompoopery. But with Obama, it's not like that. With Obama, when Mubarak falls and the Muslim Brotherhood gets in, do you, do you get the sense that Obama goes, oh no, what a horrible blunder. I've got to move really fast to prevent this terrible outcome. No, he actually seems serenely thrilled with the outcome. He only gets upset when the Egyptian military steps in and pushes out the Muslim Brotherhood. That's when he threatens to cut off US aid. In other words, and this is nothing more than simple battlefield thinking. It's time to realize we're dealing with a different kind of opponent than somebody who just doesn't get it. We're dealing with an opponent and a movement that sees America very differently. Recently, as I said, I was in the Fox News Channel having this acrimonious debate, which will be all over Fox this week, uh, uh, moderated by Meghan with Ward Churchill. Now here is a guy who became viciously embittered against America because of the Vietnam War. I don't want to argue about that war, but what is really interesting to me is that a bunch of people who turned against that war didn't just turn against Vietnam. They essentially put on the Vietnam spectacles and they turned completely against America, which meant they went right back to the beginning of American history to Columbus. And suddenly Columbus went from being the discoverer of America, Columbus Day, rah, 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 to Columbus suddenly somehow becoming some sort of a genocidal maniac. The founder of slavery and the American founders who were seen to be good guys. President's Day, 4th of July, no. Suddenly the founders became a bunch of hypocrites who said all men are created equal but allowed slavery to continue. Clearly they didn't mean it when they said all men are created equal. Bunch of liars trying to just make out well for themselves. Now, if all of this seems kind of alarming, gee, Dinesh, what are you saying? Here's my daughter sitting at the table next to me. This is her curriculum. This is what she learns in school and college every day. The reason I made this America film is I wanted to present a different side of the American story. 
The defense of America doesn't just require guns, it, re it requires history, it requires ideas, it requires new kinds of ideas and movements and movies and books and debates. Now, this is a fight that we are fully capable of winning. But we are not as resolute as the other side. We might be tough on the battlefield. They're tougher in the political realm. Look at the difference between Republican and Democratic candidates over the past 30 years, with the kind of possible exception of Reagan. It almost seemed like our candidates, their candidates get into the ring, and they're ready to fight for 15 rounds. They expect to take a couple of body blows that put them down on one knee. They're ready to get up. They fight hard. They commit immense resources to the battle, the political battle. That's, they care about it immensely. On our side, much less so. I'll give you a small example. Social media. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. The mo if I get on Twitter and I put out a tweet, there are about 30 leftists who come on Twitter within seconds and slam me from every angle. Half of these guys are paid to do that. But the other half are just doing it to do it. Now, there's nothing like this on our side. We have nobody tracking their guys and, and trying to destroy them at every turn. Why? Because politics to them is life and death. That's what they care about. That's what Obama cares about. So when he says he's going to remake the country, he's not kidding. And so don't feel that you can defeat him by making jokes about him not being able to read a teleprompter. Here's a guy who has, who has changed America more than anybody since Reagan. He has brought the Reagan revolution to a grinding halt. He has declared open war against the wealth creators. He's not talented in the normal way. America's a country, by the way, of brave men and women, of entrepreneurs and innovators and, and pioneers and fighters. That's what built this country. Obama's not one of those guys. He doesn't know how to get into a wagon and go west. No. He doesn't know how to make an iPhone. He can't even put up a website. But, but he is a master of stirring up in people envy, resentment, hatred, and directing that Politically, giving it a political expression. Now, very often we don't realize how powerful these forces are in our society. A good country channels what Lincoln called the better angels of our nature. Countries are pulled down, not because they don't understand, they're pulled down because they allow the worst impulses of human nature to take over. Those become politically the dominant force in society. When you see a guy who's successful, you don't think, gee, how do I do that? Maybe I should go back to school. Maybe I should start a business. Maybe I should invent something, come up with a new app, come up with some new way of doing things. Rather, you begin to think, gee, why does that guy have that? I would like to see myself come up, but if not, I would rather see that guy pull down. That's envy. Very powerful human emotion, very secret emotion, because no one likes to admit it even to themselves. Envy, by the way, is not jealousy. Jealousy is actually kind of noble. People confuse envy and jealousy because in both cases it's a kind of coveting. You want something that you don't have. But in jealousy, you want something that actually is yours, that you feel is taken from you. Othello is jealous. He feels his wife is cheating on him. He's wrong. But if, if, but if she were cheating on him, he'd have a right to be angry. Iago is envious. Envy means wanting something to which you have no right at all. Envy, in that sense, is the lowest of all human emotions. And, so, and, and envy is unleashed in this country. And envy goes with hatred, and it goes with self-hatred. And then along comes Obama. And what does he say? He says to the American who's feeling this way, feeling really bad, he says, listen, don't worry. You're not actually envious. You're filled with righteous indignation. 
Why? Because you see all these other Americans, they've been stealing from you. They're in possession of your stuff. But here's the good news, if you vote for me, I'll use the power of the state to go and take their stuff and I'll give some of it to you. What I'm getting at is this is our new politics in America today. It's a little bit frightening and it's a little bit scary, but it's worth knowing because if we have in this room a bunch of military guys who want to go into politics, they need a little bit of a, an introductory briefing as to what this new battlefield looks like. And I'm just trying to say, this is how I see it. Now, I was talking to um, Ayers some months ago. I was debating him on a college campus, my alma mater, Dartmouth. Uh, and I asked him, I said, um, you know, you guys started all these radical movements in the 1960s, the SDS, the Students for a Democratic Society. That's really when America split into two. And how did you do it? You were at the University of Michigan, there are 30,000 students. How many did your group have, your radical outfit? How, how many were you? He goes, well, at the peak, Dinesh, SDS, at the University of Michigan, he goes, we're about 300. 300. But, he said, we were a determined group of guys. We'd go into the president's office, we'd urinate in his waste paper basket, we'd overthrow his desk, we'd give him 50 non-negotiable demands, we refused to leave. If they try to bring the cops, we all go limp, we have the media there to take pictures. In other words, these are people who are willing to fight politically to achieve their goals. And were they successful? Yes. Because if you look at the little student handbook at the University of Michigan circa 1960, everybody looks clean cut, kind of like Jimmy Stewart or Gary Cooper, and fast forward 10 years and they look totally different. Not just a political revolution, a cultural, a moral, spiritual revolution in America in 10 years, produced by a small group of guys, very determined. They are much more committed and ruthless than we are about politics. And in order to beat them, we have to be just as smart, just as organized, just as committed, and just as tough. Now, political toughness is different than military toughness. And this is worth noting because the military, the leader in America who was the most successful in motivating the military was actually not a war hero. Bob Dole was a war hero. George Herbert Walker Bush was a war hero. But the president, far and away the most successful in getting the military on his side, was the guy who made war movies in World War II, namely Ronald Reagan. Why? Because actually Reagan was able to articulate patriotic values far better than George Herbert Walker Bush. Great a man though Bush was, Reagan was more effective in communicating politically those ideas, and that's why when Reagan walked in, the military would salute and mean it. <clears throat> it's, it's only a way of saying, it's only a way of saying that when you go into new territory, you have to learn new skills. On a very small scale, for most of my career, I've been a writer, an academic, a think tank guy. And then I looked around and I realized our whole culture is slipping away from us. And I can't sit around in a think tank and write books that are read by 800 or 8,000 or 80,000 people. I need to build a megaphone. I need to figure out a way to get through to 1, 10, 50 million people. Our existing megaphones can't do it. We need to create new ones. And so this is just a way of recognizing that it's a new culture, it's a new politics. We have a new group of people who don't want to take America where we want it to go. And so you can't say to them, you can't judge them by your standard. By Obama's standard, he has been a spectacular success. By his own standard which is not the same as our standard. We say things like, gee, you know, private business is not as strong as it used to be. Where did we get the idea that that was his goal? To strengthen private business. People are feeling the chokehold of regulation. Obama's reaction, so? That's why I have it. 
The United States is much weaker. We have a much smaller footprint in the world. That's fantastic. If since the United States has been throwing its weight around the world, it's nice to see America have a smaller footprint from his point of view. The United States is not developing energy sufficiency. Why the heck should the United States, which, which has 5% of the world's population, enjoy 25% of the world's wealth, the world's standard of living, the world's health care, and the world's energy? What gives us the right to have five times of our share of God's green earth? That's his point of view. So stop lecturing him about energy self-sufficiency. He doesn't want it. He's not moving in that direction because he has no intention of going to Chicago. If you want to go to Chicago, you go. He's going to Maine. So realism about our situation is the first step to making real progress. So I'm thrilled to be here. This is a big fight we're in. Some of our existing institutions, sadly including, I would say, frankly, the Republican Party, are in a kind of slumber. They have no idea that the culture has changed. And, and I say this completely as a loyalist, uh, a lifelong Republican. I was speaking at Harvard uh, some months ago to a group of South Asians. These are, these are kids who have come originally from India, Sri Lanka, places like that. And this woman said to me, she said, immigration is very terrifying, Dinesh. She said, you know, you feel like you're walking on a tightrope from one building to another. And at some point, your old building, let's call it India, you leave it. And you start walking on the tightrope to the new building, but you don't get there. You're in the middle. And you feel like you're not Indian, and yet you're not American. So she said to me, Dinesh, how will I know when I have become an American? I said, ma'am? You'll know you've become an American when you become a Republican. <laughs> the Republican Party is actually our best, our very much our best hope. We don't want to weaken it. We don't want to have infighting. But on the other hand, we do want to supply some wake-up bills to our friends at the Republican National Committee. Um, because they're in a new world and they don't even know it. But we know it. That's why we're here. And um, it's a new kind of combat. I'd like to be part of it. And you should too. Uh, we're in a very interesting position, very rare in history, where the fate of the country, not the survival of America, America will survive, but the fate of America as the hope for the world, as the magnet for the world, as, as the country that supplies the formula that enables tens of millions of people in other countries to rise to prosperity. That's the America we're protecting. That America is very endangered now. It's only been endangered like this three or four times in history. I said in the movie that the revolution was a struggle for the creation of America. And the Civil War was a struggle for the preservation of America. And World War II was a struggle for the protection of America. But our struggle now is for the restoration of America. Yes, we're looking for leaders. Yes, we're looking for leaders, and we do need them. But we don't have right now, we have to be frank, a Washington. We don't have a Lincoln. We don't have a Reagan. What we have instead is us. In college many years ago, a professor said to me, told me the story of the lion tamer and the lion. It's a very interesting story. Here's the lion tamer with his little ridiculous stick, which he twiddles up and down and flips up and around. And the lion begins to prance obediently to the machinations of the lion tamer. And the professor said, why is that? Who is actually more powerful, the lion tamer or the lion? It's the lion. So why is the lion so obediently responding to the lion tamer? And the answer is that the lion doesn't know that. The lion thinks that the lion tamer is more powerful. So here we are, and we're facing this predatory government 
which is taking away our freedoms, weakening our country, endangering our prosperity, and using the instruments of the state against its political enemies. Who stands between them and their objectives but us? And so I'm very honored to be in a room with some of the bravest men and women in America. I want to call you to a new kind of battle. Understand its contours, think about it, recognize the nature of a new kind of enemy, creatively putting our dedication in the same way that the left does, organizing and fighting, we can defeat them. We will not merely endure, we will also prevail. Thank you very much. Thank you.